Welcome to Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Chris, and welcome to today's guest interview. Our guest interviews are long-form interviews with leaders from around the world. They've each been selected because of their valuable perspective on leadership and work they've accomplished in this space. Today, we're joined by Johnny C. Taylor Jr., President and CEO of the Society for Human Resource Management, or SHRM, which is the largest HR professional association in the world. He's also the chairman of the President's Board of Advisors on Historically Black Colleges and Universities, an accomplished attorney, and the author of the new book, Reset, A Leader's Guide to Work in an Age of Upheaval. Welcome, Johnny. Say hi to our audience. Hey, hello, audience. It's so great to be here, and thank you for inviting me, Chris. The pleasure's all here. Um, you wear many different hats, but to kind of pull from a little Simon Sinek here, what is your why? Right. My why is twofold. So my number, number one why is being a father. I absolutely love every day being a father. I mentioned I to a couple of people the other day, I have a 30-year-old and I have an 11-year-old. And I would not be opposed to having a one-year-old two years from now. Like, I just love being a dad. So that's my passion. And it really uh, is an indication of what my other passion is professionally. And that is developing people. Because if you think about it, parenting is very much about leading and developing, you know, the future generations and helping individuals, in this case, adults in the workplace, find and maximize their potential. So so there really is some common thread there. I love helping people become their best selves. Yeah, there's a huge common thread there. In fact, uh, the the listeners of Hacking Your Leadership have jokingly come up with a Hacking Your Leadership bingo that they play with my co-host and I. And one of the one of the squares they get to check off is when Chris makes his his requisite parenting reference of how leadership and parenting tie into each other. Um, and so and so I absolutely agree with you on that. And and it's it, it's incredible how much better we are able to lead people when we love them, when, when we care about them, right? It's, apparent, it's incredible what we'll put up with and tolerate and, and forgive and assume positive intent towards when we genuinely care about the person we're talking about. And it's easy to do that, hopefully, when it's your child, harder to do that when it's an employee, um, but, but you can. You can if you want to. Well, Chris, it's funny that you mentioned that because the, the logical extension of that is there are times when just like when you're raising children, they don't fully understand the big picture. They don't see the long game. So there are points along the way, even with your employees, where they are as resistant as your children are. And they think you don't know what you're talking about. And that, of course, this is a bad decision. And you having the advantage of the big picture and ultimately the responsibility for caring and feeding. I mean, if you think about it, yes. your workers expect a paycheck every two weeks. They want their benefits to work. When they go to the doctor, they need that insurance to be provide, paid for and working in high quality. So there are a lot of parallels there. People don't like it a lot because, it, again, it feels paternalistic or maternalistic when you make these sorts of statements about your employees. But when you talk about caring for people, caring isn't always telling people what they want to hear. It's telling them what they need to hear. Yeah, well, you have to earn the right to do that, right? Like, you, to, in order to tell somebody what they need to hear, you, you they have to be able to take it as that it is from a position of I'm trying to help you get better, not I'm trying to make my life easier by helping you not be as much of a burden on me. And and, and that's a very different place to come from when you're when you're giving advice. That's right. Sure, indeed, indeed. Um, I want to ask you about the journey of writing this book because it started out very differently, and you clearly pivoted at some point. Talk about that change and what the catalyst for it was. Yes. Yeah, so I'm sitting at home and like many of you may be able to relate to, I travel in my job 70% of the time. We have 575 chapters throughout America. We have members in 165 countries. We actually have physical offices at the time in China, in India, in Dubai. So let's just say out of 365 days a year, it's not unusual for me to be on the road 250 to 300 of those days. And even when I'm not traveling, it's the commuting time. You get up in the morning, you get the kid together, you take them to school, you know, you just spend a lot of time doing stuff, preparing to work. Well, then the pandemic happens. March of, and I remember, at least in the US, March 13th, Friday the 13th of 2020, everything kind of shut down. So I found all of this time time that, again, I'd spent communicating, uh, commuting and preparing my child for school and doing those things. I was now, I got up in the morning and I didn't have anywhere to go. And so I, it gave me an opportunity to wake up and, and just reflect, reflect on how differently the world was going to be post-pandemic. Now, to be fair, 
as I early on in March and April, I think as we all thought, this is going to be 21 days. The country will shut down and we'll get back to normal. 30 days, even 60 days, because, you know, whatever. None of us predicted, you know, six months in that this thing would still be happening. And for sure, I would have bet a check, a paycheck, that we wouldn't be here 18 months later still talking about a pandemic or 15 months later still talking about a pandemic. So at that point, I pivoted from my initial thoughts about a book and I was going to call it the great pause to no, this is a reset. There's something very different. Uh, a pause, if you think about old school tape recorders or whatever we're doing, right? Pause means you stop momentarily and you pick up just where you left off. Reset, which it became clear as I began to write the book in the sixth or seventh month on this journey. So the fall of last year, I started saying, no, this is going to be fundamentally game changing. Life as we knew it. Uh, will never be the same. And these aren't sort of incremental changes. They're going to be sea changes, like monumental changes in the way we work. Who is an employee? What are the policies around work? Everything is going to be for real different. So that's what prompted me as I evolved. I evolved from a great pause mindset in writing a book to a total reset. Mindset. I know the phrase, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? We've heard that before. Um, it's, it's why resets, I think, typically aren't what organizations do. They prefer, they prefer evolution over revolution. Um, do you think the, the intersecting of these massive shifts in our cultural zeitgeist, not just COVID and, and working from home, but racial and social injustice, wealth inequality, all these things kind of together, these, these intersecting of all these different things, that, does that mean there's no baby left and that's why there's a reset or or is there is there still a baby there worth saving? Interesting. The the theory of my book is that we are at a reset moment. But if you read it closely, uh, I'm not sure we're actually going to experience or take advantage of the reset. I think the human nature is to hold on to things. Um, and I use this example and this, this visual, if I can help your, your listening audience appreciate it. Uh, March of last year, April of last year, 2020, we were literally locked in our homes and we stayed away from other human beings. By June or July, we said, okay, we're gonna start interacting again, but it's gonna be socially distanced, right? Six feet away. By September, October of 2020, we were, um, we were within one feet, one foot of each other. So social distance went from six foot to one foot, right? Six feet to one foot. I'm going to get that right. And then I started seeing something that I never would have predicted. People in January, February of this year started elbow bumping. By March, we were fist bumping. And now when I go to meetings, people are hugging again. I mean, it's the damnedest thing. And I thought, I mean, if you follow me in this evolution, I thought we had left the hug behind. I thought that, you know, truly in the reset moment, we all began to appreciate that it's pretty not clean to hug people. And shaking hands is actually pretty dirty because you don't know how well the person, the other person, how hygienic or they're not they are. And I thought those days are done. In fact, I was interviewed early on and I remember this vividly in April and they said, what do you think is the one thing that we'll never ever go back to? And I said, hugging and handshaking. And I was so wrong, right? So I say that it's a long way of describing and, and responding to your answer. This is a reset moment, but I'm not so sure human beings are really gonna take full advantage of it and truly reset. I think it's gonna be somewhere between a pause and a reset. That's simultaneously comforting and a little scary too, because I, you know, the I think the the desire to hug and to handshake is a very humanistic thing. It, it's us hanging on to to part of a, a strong part of our humanity, right? But there are things that that should go the way of the dinosaur that can come out of this too, and and threading that needle and finding the right things to be able to throw out to to enhance our humanity rather than you know try to replace it with something else that it that it isn't. I think is going to be something we all struggle with for a little bit. Well, no, and even even the concept. So, and we'll t I talk a lot about this in the book, like something as simple as what is an employee, right? Going forward, 
What we saw during this reset moment was for the first time in history, right, unemployed people, uh, we included, I should say, in unemployment benefits, people who'd never been employed. Mm -hmm. Think about gig economy. Yep. So you were literally to have it, you were able to have it both ways. I am, I don't, I want to work for myself. I want to make as much money as I want to make, but uh-oh, if the economy goes to hell and I can't provide for myself as a nine, as a 1099 a person or a contract, independent contractor, I want society's, um, what, what is otherwise provided to employees as a, as a safety net. We want it all. And that's an interesting dynamic at play. How can we as a society, A, afford that, that you can both be an independent contractor and have all of the benefits of an employee? And should we? Uh, those are interesting questions that we are now, like what would have happened with, you know, you look on these sites like um, Upwork right now, mm -hmm. uh, where people, you know, they, they say that we've got 20 million people who don't work for anyone, but will do your spot projects. Okay, great. Well, if the, kind of, if the economy, let's say we go back to a 2008 era meltdown and those people don't have meaningful uh, income coming in, who's to provide for them? Should employees be treated the same way as non-employees? Because hell, then there's no incentive to be an employee and have social security taken out of your check and have taxes and all of that. So we, we're at this interesting place where employees policymakers, employers are all trying to figure out what are the learnings that we should take, to your point, after in a post-pandemic world, what should we take forward with us? What are good changes and what are not so good changes? Hybrid work, work from home, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages to it. You know, all of the headlines right now focus on, oh my gosh, it's wonderful that people should be able to work remotely without talking about some real losses. You talk about human beings. We long to touch. We long to be around other people. So if everyone's working remotely, you lose some of that, right? Just right. as you want people to hug and shake hands, well, it's kind of hard to do that virtually. I like the phrase that you use, age of upheaval, as opposed to just upheaval. And, and the implication to me, whether this was intentional or not, is that this is ongoing. It, it, it wasn't an event, you know, like leading people through an event that would be considered upheaving, like a reorg or being bought by another company. That's a different proposition than leading people when the upheaval is so sustained that it becomes the norm. What, what are some of the skills that you've seen in people leaders over the last 18 months that have led to success, but maybe weren't as requisite in 2019 or earlier? Well, from a leader's perspective, the number one skill that I've seen uh, and, and frankly, it had atrophied over time was empathy. Hmm. Uh, it's a word that, you know, historically oh, people conflate with sympathy and therefore it's a soft word, but empathy is very different. And what we have seen over this period of time is leaders have had to, been forced to, thankfully, they've been forced to visit in their own minds, like, hmm, I wonder what my employees' experiences are. Like, I know what my lived experience is, but what are the lived experiences of my single uh, parent female employees who now don't have a nanny at home like I do, can't afford tutors for their children, don't have six bedroom homes where they can work from their office, and they all have to take care of children and work and do everything in a two bedroom apartment, right? Empathy became one of the skills and, and attribute, attributes that this age of upheaval has forced us to acknowledge has value. I completely agree with that. I, I think, you know, this is this is at the front of the mind of, of a lot of leaders right now is what is what is the workplace look like when the dust settles of COVID, right? And and no matter who you talk to, it seems to be this kind of binary decision. We're going back to the office or we're not going back to the office. And it is it, it just seems like whatever whatever they land on is going to be wrong for somebody at that organization or for many people at that organization if you consider that choice binary as opposed to kind of meeting people where they are and understand that you know wor work is a safe place for some people who don't want to be at home. Yeah, yeah, you make a really good point. And that's that's what's so you know, it's frustrating 
at times when the media and thankfully people not like you try to, you know, take shortcuts and we want to just solve a problem, make very simplistic responses and answers to complex, uh, you know, really complicated issues. And this one size fits all thing doesn't work. Right. It just doesn't work. And we as leaders to answer the question. So empathy is number one. But the second one is flexibility. Mm -hmm. And we we talk about agility in business terms. We love agile workforces, blah, blah, blah. And we talk about flexibility, but we've not necessarily embraced that when it comes to leadership, leading people. The idea and just a simple word that we've used, Chris, a lot, which is I want to treat everyone equally. Well, that is such a 1970s and 80s concept. How about treating people equitably? Right. That's the new leader. The leader has to understand that a part of flexibility is equity, not equality. Now, you do want people to have equal opportunities. Yes. But how it manifests itself and the outcomes will not just need to be equitable, not necessarily equal. And so I just had this happen to me. So one of our employees is a single dad, as am I, but he came in and he says, I know we're supposed to be in the office from nine until six, name the time. He said, but because I have to drop my daughter off, I need to get here at 930. So I said, hey, no problem, makes sense to me. And he said, and then I have to leave a little earlier because I have to pick my daughter up before six o'clock because the camp starts charging after that. Got it. Well, one of the female employees said, well, that means you have to offer it to all of us. I said, no, I don't. Well, why is it fair that he gets to do it? I said, because he is a kid. Well, why is it? I mean, they went on and on and on. I said, there you are. You're focusing on being treated equally. I've never promised you that I'm going to treat you equally as a leader. My job is flexibility. I have to treat you equitably. So if there's a special or or even a, 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 an accommodation of some sort that you'd like, let's talk about it. But it's not because... I need to give it to you because I gave it to the person sitting next to you. That's ridiculous. So again, I want to focus on equity as a different concept and flexibility, as well as uh, this empathy thing. What you're talking about here is something that, that goes to the heart of a lot of leadership struggles, a lot of little leadership problems, and a lot of leaders who feel they are ill-equipped to handle leading leading teams of people and that's this kind of this introduction of subjectivity into leadership we've always looked at we're, we're, we're going to be objective you know it's it's the reason why the company wants to decide we're working from home or we're going back to the office you by by making a decision at some high level you in essence take the leadership component out of it from any, all of the middle managers there's no decision to make there's no there's nothing to lead anymore you're just managing the implementation of a strategy leading people means being able to look at the sub, the situation subjectively and deciding how to move forward with each person and that is that is scary if you as an individual leader don't have a history where you can look back and say, look at my actions. They are in service of these values that I say I will do. And any decision I make, you can connect those decisions to those values. They may not all seem equal on paper when you look at them one at a time, but in the broader context, when looked at it through the lens of my values, they will all line up and I'll be very predictable as a leader. Very, very hard for a lot of leaders to do that right now. Well, not only is it hard for the leaders to do it, the systems, we talk a lot about systemic biases. Mm -hmm. Listen, We have systems that don't allow us to do it. The EEOC says, well, if you treat Johnny one way, then Mary has to be treated the same way. And so the leaders, many of us were, um, became leaders, grew up as leaders in an environment where the law doesn't allow you to have subjectivity. In fact, you're oftentimes penalized for being, you know, using subjectivity in work. And so we're, we're torn. Right. You sure. really are torn because of the requirements uh, that our legal landscape and our policymakers have thrust upon us. Right. It, it's a real problem. So I'm not as quick to judge leaders because they're trying to manage in an environment where they're conflicted oftentimes because they're just their hands are tied. The other thing, though, that is that we're struggling through is employees. You you have, you, you, you alluded to this earlier, but oftentimes, no matter what decision I make, half the people will disagree. Mm, always. Right. right. Our country is so divided. 
and I'd love to talk about this in the context of diversity later on if we get the chance, but definitely. But we are so divided right now until leaders are like, I don't know what to do, right? Because half of you will agree with me, the other half will violently disagree. And then you'll go out on social media, uh, you'll go on these uh, employment websites, the glass doors, and you'll just trash me. Even though, you know, because today you disagree with one decision I made, forget the other 99 with which you agree, you disagree with me on this one issue. And so now I'm a bad manager. So I do want to tell you, people managers are facing, uh, I I don't know why you voluntarily agree to do it, because it's that (laughs) damn frustrating these days. There's like not enough money. I had someone the other day who said, I don't want to manage one person ever again. In fact, a joke someone said to me, um, I was interviewing a candidate and I said, why do you want to come into HR? And the person said, because I love people. And I said, that means you don't know HR. (laughs) (laughs) Have a little bit of time with employees and you're like, I hate them all. People are nuts. Uh, But yeah, and I'm being obviously glib here, but but, but my point is these are really, the people manager jobs are the most increasingly complicated and complex and nuanced jobs that we've ever seen. What we're trying to do, and as HR professionals, is to equip people managers with the things they need to be successful. It's a practice, not a science. Managing people is very much a practice. And you you and I were talking about the Sherm SCP and taking the exam. And one of the reasons that you passed and did well is because you've practiced HR for a while. Some of the mistakes that I made as an early practitioner, I don't make now. And but along the way, I was equipped with, you know, with real courses on how to be a great HR person. And we're not doing that with people managers. We thrust the best engineer into the manager of engineers because he or she is good as a technician. And then we don't help them become good at people management. So that's an opportunity for us. I talk about it in the book. It's something that Sherm is focused on, not from an HR per se perspective, HR profession, but from a human resources more broadly perspective. We got to get better people managers in place. I think there's a tendency for a lot of leaders to de-risk their hiring and promoting decisions because they look at the paths that previous hiring managers took and they don't want to be called out. Meaning if if I don't hire the best engineer to lead the engineer team, instead I bring somebody in who's never been an engineer, but I'm really confident in their people skills, leadership skills, and for some reason they end up failing. Now my head's on the chopping block as the person who didn't go the traditional path. I brought somebody in that shouldn't have gone that route and everybody goes, well, see, that's why they didn't work out. But if I bring somebody in who is the best engineer to lead the engineers, who has no business leading the engineers because they have no people skills, and they fail, now it's on them. It's like, well, I did what everybody else did, and that person failed. It's on them. And and it I, it's going to take some hiring managers to say... The, the the risk is hiring the wrong person to begin with, not in, you know, not following the previous path that everybody else took before me. Just because a million people took it before me doesn't mean it's right. Well, and and I talk about a little bit of that. I, I get to that in the context of uh, hiring from untapped pools of talent, right? right? This idea, it's the same concept. In my book, Reset, we're talking about the formerly incarcerated. Mm -hmm. We're talking about older workers. We're talking about people who are differently abled. So just going veterans, like tapping into pools of people we've historically not done because they don't look like the perfect candidate on paper. In fact, there are a lot of things about their backgrounds that would suggest to you that they won't be great. And, you know, we're, we're, we're taking the safe route, right? Sure. Who would hire someone who's gotten out of prison? Well, that's risk. And so we don't hire that person, even though they could be phenomenal. Well, it's your point. Same thing when it comes to selecting when you as you extend this to hiring people managers. We only want people who have absolute, you know, central casting backgrounds. I went to college. I came out of college. I was a technician. I rose up from an engineer one, engineer two, engineer three. And now I'm the manager of engineers. And that's the way we do it. And what I'm trying to do is not just in the context of untapped pools of talent, but just broadly, we have got to be willing to take more risk. And it goes back to subjectivity. Like what, what we do is we won't take those risks because we want to be objective. And we want to be objective because if you hire Joe, who's the non-traditional candidate who doesn't have the typical background over Mary, in this instance, who's been an engineer for three, four, five years, then the EEOC says, explain why you did that. And it must be because you don't like women. 
okay, yeah, Chris, this gets a little complicated. That's why the tension between subjectivity, objectivity, taking risk on hires comes under siege. Your employees are upset because they thought, you know, Mary should have gotten it because she is the perfect res resume for it. And you're, you're, you know, she's the, the one with that poses the less, the least amount of risk. And then the federal government says, why are you doing this? You should have never hired Joe over Mary, although Joe might be the perfect candidate for the job. There are a lot of hiring managers. You talk about the, the formerly incarcerated where the risk they see isn't that, oh, what if this person is dishonest or what if this, you know, they don't see that the risk. The risk they see is in potential of litigation if something happens that's completely unrelated to this person and then someone else says, oh, see, that's why this happened because that person was hired there and the leader's going, this has nothing to do with that person, but it opens up that door for the outside going, oh, that's where, that's where the breakdown occurred. That's the risk they're trying to avoid, not the risk of the person. They might trust the person implicitly. Well, not only that. So you're right. Once again, I'm sound like I'm, I'm a lawyer by training, as you know, it feels <laughs> like I'm anti-lawyer, a lawyer, the law today. But once again, the legal environment does not reward you for taking those risks. Right. You hire someone who's formerly incarcerated, and to your point, even if what they did had nothing to do with a subsequent um, problem, uh, they will attribute some of that to that person's background. And you as an employer, uh, uh, the, the perception or at the end of the day, the conclusion is you undertook risk you shouldn't have, and therefore you are penalized and people question your judgment and everything. So that is partly, but I will tell you one other thing that we're seeing in our research around untapped pools of talent. And this is where I flip a lot of this off of employers and management onto employees and workers. When it comes, for example, to hiring the formerly incarcerated, HR departments and CEOs and boards have said, give them a second chance. What we're hearing is employees say, yeah, I like that, but not to sit next to my daughter. Mm. So employees say one thing, and it's that NIMBY concept, not sure. in my backyard, right? I want to feel good that I voted for something, but I don't want it to affect me. I don't want it to affect me, <laughs> right. period. Yeah. And so we see a lot of that, which is why you know it, it's, the, it's not as enough for us to have leaders from CEOs to other C-suite members, HR, to say, we're going to give these people a chance because the employees are unforgiving. Mm -hmm. Our workers hold us to a level of perfection as well. I think the real and most, most effective way at making this sort of change is for us to start appealing to people and having these very types of conversations. And that's what I was hoping to do as in Reset. It is a full, it's an age of upheaval. Think about it. Five years ago, 10 years ago, if I would never, as the head of SHRM, be on a podcast talking about hiring the formerly incarcerated, you're supposed to be a tough on crime, we're doing background checks, we're blah, blah, blah. And here we are at this moment where I'm revisiting everything. You've spoken many times about the importance of data when it comes to SHRM and when it comes to making decisions. And I think, I think data-driven decisions can help you de-risk the decision because if you have to explain it later, you can say, well, this is the data that led me to the decision, or at least that, that helped influence that. I want to talk about that in the context of diversity, equity, and inclusion, because you know, we, we hear often that diversity is the, the what and inclusion is the how, meaning you can, you can check off boxes for diversity all you want to. You can look at an Excel spreadsheet and say whether or not a company is diverse. Um, that Excel spreadsheet's not going to tell you how much sustained work needs to be done in hiring people because it's a, 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 a revolving door of the people you're trying to get in and keep there, but they're not staying because they don't have the support they need. They don't have the, they don't feel included, even though they feel hired. Um, you know, what, what's, what can data do when it comes to things like inclusion, where it's, it's a lot harder to kind of say, Oh, these, these people are included. You can say they're hired, but, but how do you get them to, to, how do you check that? that what you're doing in the DEI space is working from an inclusion and equity standpoint. That's the problem. We have measured diversity efforts for years. And in fact, we've gotten pretty damn good at measuring activity, right? Sure. How many genders did you go to? How many black people or women or, or Latinos or how many people did you interview? Like we've done that. That is, as my daughter says, so 90s, right? <laughs> 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 and I thought 90s wasn't that far that long ago. And she makes it sound like it's a lifetime because she wasn't born. I feel triggered um, and old right now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But so we have measured things. What we haven't figured out 
is inclusion. We really don't even have a real way, and SHRM is working on what we call a belonging index or an inclusion index, some way to say, okay, so you, you've achieved diversity. By the way, it's going to be much easier over time to do because right now we know K through 12 public schools in America are majority minority. So diversity is a coming. That's sure. not the big deal. Who cares, right? It's almost like, okay, whatever. So now how included, how belonged, how equitably treated are individuals once they come into your organization? And we have got to figure out, and as a profession, we're working on it now, how do you capture that? Is it, you know, is turnover an indicator? Yes. But the problem with a lot of the data that we collect is it's deep as a puddle. Mm -hmm. So great. I can tell you have 20% turnover amongst women, but why? You've not truly assessed that. You've not really dug into the data to get meaningful learnings from it. That's the problem. So we are doing a very good job of measuring diversity. We're getting better at measuring inclusion, but we have done a histor uh, historically a horrible job at assessing and really understanding both data that have been collected. If you look at um, companies who don't ever have to look for people, meaning they put a, a, a job out there, an opening out there, and there's a hundred applicants for every one opening they have. I think a lot of those companies have are actually uh, the, the muscle that it takes to have a diverse workforce has never had to be exercised in those people because they've never had to look for people. They always just come to them. And, and some of the other companies where it might be harder to find people, they might be even better at finding the people that you need and having a diverse workforce because they have to go out and look to begin with. Well, so I've said that a lot and without naming specific names, we all know the companies that are consistently listed as the best places to work. And by the way, many of them are not the best places to work. They're the most prominent invisible brands. Mm -hmm. And so everyone thinks they're the best place to work. But I have found that some of the best diversity, equity, inclusion work is in small and medium-sized businesses who have to compete for talent. Yep. They not only they can't throw all of the money that the big boys can throw, so they don't have the cash, the equity, the cachet. And so they've got to find the diverse talent. They've got to work hard to keep the diverse talent because what happens is the big firms let the small and medium-sized firms do all of the hard work of finding diverse talent. And then they let you test them. Oh, Johnny, you know, big company A would never hire Johnny, but little uh, mid-sized company B will. Johnny gets there and oh my gosh, he's a star. And then big company A goes and poaches him, right? <laughs> because they can, they have the money, the resources, everything. So yeah, I have found that some of the best DE&I practices are what we at Sherman refer to as IE&D because I believe inclusion is even more important than diversity these days. Is, is they are in that space because they know what it takes to get people and to keep them. I had a, a leader say to me once who was the, he, he was in charge of diversity and inclusion at the time. There, the equity wasn't on the, on the radar at this point, but it, it, was, it was diversity and inclusion. And, and he gave me kind of a for instance. And he said to me, imagine if you were hired for a job, you went through the interview process, you got hired. And on the first day you walked into work, you walked into work and you were the only white person there and every single one of your coworkers was black. Would you, would you think something of that? And I said, well, it would, it would probably make me do a double take because I'd never worked in a place like that before. He's like, exactly. He said, if I'm going to hire you for that, my job as a leader is to pull you aside and say, I want you to know that you're going to look different than a lot of the people you're working alongside, but I want you to understand that you were picked for this job because I think you're the best person for it and for, and for no other reason. And, and, and to basically call out the elephant in the room as opposed to pretending it doesn't exist or that it doesn't happen. H how important is doing that in terms of setting up the support system for people who might come into a role or an organization where they don't see a lot of people who look like them? It's the most important thing we can do. It's, that's how you give people a sense of belonging. You acknowledge that walking into the room, and believe me, as an African-American man, I've lived this life all my life. I, li I went to graduate school in Iowa, okay? So I have, and I remember getting there and the dean saying, now listen, this isn't Florida where you grew up, South Florida, which is incredibly diverse. You're coming to, I mean, a very, very white place. And he said, but this is the world, but I want you to know I am here to support you. 
as you go through, if you need my support, by the way, he was, it was, he said, I don't want to play. One of the most dangerous things that I've seen, I've seen in diversity work is when people assume that I'm going to need your help. I don't want paternalistic diversity. It's the most annoying thing in the world. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm going to come help you, young black boy. I'm like, no, no, stop it. I kind of can. I, now, if I need help, I want to know that I can come to you and you will listen to me and listen to hear not to respond like those sorts of things. Right. So, yes. But let me say something else that's really important. And I think over time is going to become even more of an issue. And I tell you, I worked what what reminds me of it is the story that you just described. But but I worked at Viacom. And Viacom at the time when I was there, everyone knows they owned MTV, BET, Paramount Pictures, you name it, Blockbuster. And then the point is, a couple of years into my tenure there, we acquired BET, Black Entertainment Television. And I got to tell you how funny it was to see uh, minority communities in a majority environment act the same way or behave, engage in the behavior that we complained about, right? And where am I going with that? You just described the situation, you walk in and everyone's black. Well, that was at BET. I remember literally talking to an executive saying, there's another employee at Showtime Networks, one of our sister companies, um, Asian woman who wants to come work at BET. And this person says, she's not going to make it here. She, no, we only hire black people. And I was like, oh, do you hear yourselves? So you say, Johnny, why are you bringing it up? Because as we have a more diverse workforce, we're going to have to ask ourselves, when a, a company that's run by women and dominated by women, when they bring a man in, are they going, willing to do the same thing that we're asking men to do for women? When you go into an environment where the minorities are the majority, are they going to be willing to do this for what will then be underrepresented minorities? So this diversity, equity, inclusion, um, these muscles that we need to develop are not just for uh, Black people and women. And, you know, they're not. This is something all of us have to build is an ability to accept uh, difference. Political affiliation. We're seeing it right now. It's so easy to immediately say, well, I'm right and people who don't think like me are wrong. Diversity includes diversity of perspective. And that means when someone who is right walks into an environment that is majority left, are we willing to do exactly what you just described? Uh, right now, I don't think we are. What you talk about is almost a, uh, you know, it's 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 uh, evolutionary biology. It's it's tribalism. You know, it's it's the desire to be around people who who we identify with and relate to. And it, and you know, on us on an animalistic level, it's it's safety related. But 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 we can't get that out of our lizard brain, right? We 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 carry it with us all the time. Um, and I think you know, it 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 becomes incumbent upon leaders to find the jumping off points for relationships to form between people when there are no jumping off points at first glance or on the surface, because just, just kind of growing up or living in the same area means there's going to be something. It, 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 even if, even if it's that we both have kids that are the same age or, or that we both went to, we studied the same thing with the same music, same book, same whatever, find those things. And, and tribalism can be created on those things. It doesn't have to be on the, the, the visible demographics. Well, Chris, that's my issue. And, and I, you, my gosh, you music to my ears. I think one of the biggest failures of the diversity work that we've done for the last two to three decades was we focused on our differences and not our commonalities. And so I'm not surprised that after all of this diversity work that we've done, we are divided. Because guess what? We talked about it. I remember the language back in the 80s of valuing our differences, tolerating our, you know, we, we were just all focused on how different we were. Right. As opposed to acknowledging that despite the fact that you're a white male, I'm a black male, that I lived in California, you live in California. We both are born in June. When I walk into a holiday party or a reception and I don't know someone, I walk up and I immediately start looking for what we have in common. Where'd you go to school? 
how many kids do you have? What do your kids do? You know, we're, what we're doing is we're trying to find the bond, the tie that bonds us. We know we're different, but I mean, hell, I grew up with two sisters and each one of us are different from the other, right? That's, that's a given. What we're trying to do is find a commonality. And I think that's going to be the biggest push for diversity, equity, inclusion professionals going forward is to stop, stop uh, doing all of our work to identify and in fact, um, dig us into our tribes, our tribalistic nature. We've got to pull people together who are different and let them understand that we have far more in common than we have different. Yeah, I, I, it just goes back to lazy leadership in that in that it's if you're if all you want to do is is make sure that the Excel spreadsheet looks like it should, then then that's an easy one to say to your boss, look at I did my job and made sure that they're the right number of the right kind of people are in the right places. Um, but but again, it speaks nothing as to it's a, whether or not they'll be successful or whether or not there's going to be relationships or they're going to bring their best work or there's going to be turnover. I mean, the, the amount of effort, sustained effort that companies put in to this work every year, you can you can look at that as a as a as a badge of the oh this is important to them, or you could look at it as that you know if you it had worked. done it right to begin with, you wouldn't <laughs> need to put as much into it, you know. Amen and amen. I mean, I heard someone tell me my company has been doing diversity for thirty years. I said, and how'd that work out? I mean, I mean that's also. Awesome. <laughs> and you talk about the importance of measuring and assessing and and data. Well, that's the way we're also going to make some progress. A lot of the activity that we've engaged in didn't work. And but we're unwilling to report out on that. So we like to say, oh, I went to X and I did that. The question is, did it work? I want to ask you a little bit about your job as a leader, not in terms of how SHRM influences the broader workforce, but you are a leader of people. At the end of the day, you are a leader of a company. You have direct reports. You're responsible for their development and their growth. I, I had a mentor say to me once, and I, someone I really respect, she said that she begins every career conversation with a direct report, whether it's a you know quarterly or annual review, with two questions. She says, do you know why this organization exists on the planet, and are you excited by that? Because if the answer to either of those questions is no, the rest of this conversation is just going to suck. So, so I want to ask you, Johnny, why does your employer, SHRM, exist? How do you make sure the people in your organization know why it exists and how you keep them excited by it. I love it. Let me tell you, I joined Sherm in late December 17th of 2017. So effectively, January, I had the opportunity to begin meeting with employees. And I asked in one question, I said, what's our purpose? And I, I'm talking to current employees. You know, I did my look and listening tour and, and that kind of thing and talked to current employees. And people could recite the mission. They could recite the vision. They could tell me the values that were up on the wall, but no one could tell me our purpose. And that's, that was a big aha moment for me because it's exactly what your mentor and what you have now put to me is, why, why should people come work here? I mean, if it's money, there are people who can pay you more. If, you know, so that's not it. Like, what's the thing that keeps you coming here. And I, we therefore had to bring then executive team together and a cross section of employees. And we came up with, what's our purpose? Because we never asked that question. And the question and the answer that we came out of that literally within a month of May start. So February 1st, we announced to the world our purpose. It was to elevate HR. Very simply, not those long drawn out mission statements, but elevate HR. Now, what do I mean by that? Because this is what was so critical. Three things. We want to elevate the HR professional. We need to equip him or her, them with the skills that they need to practice great HR. That's what we do. So we provide a lot of resources and anyone who comes and works at Sherm has to know we are committed to equipping HR professionals with the skills they need to pull off great HR. Secondly, we need to elevate the HR profession. All of us have seen the office. Most depictions of HR on, in mass media are not positive, right? Mm -hmm. It's the laughing stock of everything. Sure. So or the police. They're the laughing stock or, or the police. Or the police. One yeah. of the two. And so our goal purposefully is to say we're going to elevate HR. People should be as proud of being an HR professional as they are a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever. And then the third thing, which is really important, I think will resonate with you, is that we said we're going to elevate people, HR. So HR is human resources, people. 
And in within organizations where we have historically focused on the capital, the capital, you know, buildings and equipment and all of these sorts of things, we're going to elevate people, their importance, their criticality to organizations. It's how stuff gets done. There is no product without people. There is no service without people. So those three things. And so I now our mantra is we elevate HR, the HR professional, the HR profession, and HR meaning people in the workforce. I love it. And and what do you do to make sure that if you have a direct report, how do you know that they're excited by that mission? What are the what are the some of the things you listen for? We listen for almost in everything. When you bring an idea to me, it should include and tie back, not subtly, but expressly, that you're going to help. This will help us achieve our purpose. And, if, and, and literally, that's sort of the lens through which I judge everything. When someone comes in and says, I want to do this, or I want, to hide, I want this new role, I want to fund it. I said, so how does that help us achieve our purpose? And if they can't articulate it, I send them back. So it's not always a, a you know an unfair test. Sometimes they haven't like been able to articulate. They go back and I say, but until we can have any discussion about this investment in people and stuff, is you've got to be able to explain that to me because that's why we exist. And I got to tell you, Sherm has been incredibly had been incredibly successful for seventy years before I got here. Um, but we are we have taken off, and I will tell you almost. I can almost attribute it to that question. What's our purpose? And then everyone gets aligned behind that purpose. And if you aren't aligned with that, you can't work here. So let me say this too quickly. We've actually gotten rid of a lot of people who could not commit to that, who would not align. It was amazing to me that you had people who worked in HR who had no, who did not hold HR in high regard. This was a job to them. And that's all it was. And it was like, you can't work here. Period. I, I, you can be great at that job, but you can't work here. If you're in technology and every time you develop a new product or update our website or do whatever, if you're not saying this is so that we can achieve our purpose, then you can't work here. I want to be respectful of your time, but there is one more question I want to ask you. Going back to the concepts in, in, in your book, if I am a leader of people, not just a CEO, because I, kn- I know a lot of the book is written towards the C-suite, but if I'm a leader of people, even in middle management, what are the signs that I should be looking for that might lead me to believe that, that a, a reset, as you put it, um, is needed in my organization? What should I be looking for? Let me just clarify. This book is written, I intentionally did not write it to CEOs. It was intended to be for leaders broadly, including that frontline manager who has, you know, 10 people in a fast food restaurant that you're responsible for, you know, servicing and, and leading every day. So, so it is for everyone. I hope there's something in there for everyone. But um, so what are the things you're looking for? Number one, turnover. You've got to look at turnover in your organization. If people are leaving at a really significant clip, then you need to understand why. Sometimes you want that turnover. It's good to get fresh ideas. People who are not, I told you, if you weren't committed to our purpose, you had to go. So all turnover isn't bad, but you've got to look at it. Secondly, and this is important, it's probably as important as turnover is something that you would look at, is you've got to look at your employee survey uh, engagement results. You, if you don't, if you're not a big company, and you're listening here saying, Johnny, I don't have $100,000 a year to go hire some big firm to do this. There are tools that you can um, online and at charm.org, by the way, where you can gauge your employees' sentiment. Like, how are things going? And yes, there'll always be people who say this isn't right or people who disagree with you, but you can see trends. You can see trend lines. And if you do this, not once a year, not every other year, but We now do a lot of spot surveys, right? You do them once, they call them pulse surveys, by the way. Once a month, ask three or four questions. You know, do you feel like you belong here? Do you think that you're compensated reasonably fairly? I mean, qualified however you want, because no one's ever paid what they think they're worth. But I just would encourage everyone listening, you can do your own fairly unsophisticated four or five questions that you ask, even if you're managing 10 people, um, five people, periodically, once a quarter, if not more often, to figure out what what's going on here. And then thirdly, and this is something that I use a lot and, and people it, we've gotten away from it, the open door. Um, what do I mean by that? 
if your employees can't tell you, they either don't feel that it's safe to tell you or because you there will be repercussions or that you're not going to hear it anyway. If you don't have a true open door, then the employees are going to vote with their feet. We have a real talent crunch in this country. 10.1 million open vacants, open jobs right now in America, more than we've ever had since they collected the records. We also have an interesting dynamic. Americans had fewer children. Since 2000, the birth rate is on a two decade low, 4% fewer children born last year during the pandemic, naturally, right? So if you think for a second, uh, you will have the luxury of just running through talent, you're wrong. You've got to get people, you've got to keep them, you've got to have their hearts and their minds so that they take care of you because they know that you're taking care of them. Those are the three things that I think every leader, no matter the level, can do. Survey in some way your employees periodically, keep your door open, okay? And then without a doubt, uh, my my first, and, and I, I think it's the arguably the most important thing that you can do. Thank you so, so much for that. I think there's a lot, a lot of good stuff in there. Give our audience an ask, you know, uh, what, what can they do for you? The, the book, as we're listening right now, the book came out yesterday. Where can they go buy it? All of the normal places. You can go to your local bookstore. You can go to Amazon. You can go. There are tons of places. Fortunately, there are no shortage of books and, and ways to get them. Please get them. But bigger than that. Um, so get one for yourself, but give it to someone who you think uh either is a great leader, and this is a funny one, or a horrible leader. That's what I actually, more than giving it to a great leader, I'd like you to think about that person in your world who actually needs some improvement and give it to them. We're approaching the holiday season, and I don't even think you should wait that long, but I mean, the idea is give it to them. Because if you are really, if you care about human beings, even people that you wish, um, that, that, you know, you're not, fond of, if you care for them and particularly the people to whom who report to them, give them this. This is intended from SHRM to help equip them. Our goal in writing the book is to literally talk to leaders about how to operate in an age of upheaval. Can our audience connect with you in any way? Where, where should they reach out if they want to connect? Absolutely. So SHRM CEO at SHRM.org. So S-H-R-M CEO at shrm.org. It's an email. I receive them. I respond to them. So with that, that's pretty wide open. Lots of, and I'm going to, I get the hits, but I will absolutely respond. And then check me out every week. I'm in USA Today. I have a column. I'm the Dear Abby of the Career World. It's called Ask HR. And I also have a column. So it's a column in USA Today every week where we talk about these issues from the employer and the employee experience. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Johnny. We'll put a link in the podcast description to, uh, to buy the book, as well as to the, uh, the most recent article from uh, your, your contribution to USA Today. Um, again, thank you so much, and uh, we hope to have you back sometime. Thank you. Be well.